Hi everybody, Mark Cook with Kid Planes Magazine here on our Build and Fly program at AirVenture 2024. Day two for us, little cloudy skies, but it's still a great crowd here. I'm here with Chris Gaiman, who is the OAM sales manager for Lycoming. We're obviously going to talk about some engines here, but you know what we're seeing this year, we have an awful lot of anniversaries. You know, we've got Kit Fox, we've got Breezy, we have Zenith. And so I, I thought I'd ask, is there a major anniversary for the Thunderbolt line, or we've just been doing it a long time? Uh, no major milestone for Thunderbolt this year. We're about 20 years, but Lycoming itself is celebrating 95, so big year for that, at least. Must be doing something right if you That's keep right. banking them out. Yep. So, so the Thunderbolt's been around for about 20 years. Yes, sir. Uh, take us back a little bit. What was the impetus for the, the Thunderbolt? What kind of market forces said, sure. we need to do that? Sure. So. As uh, a lot of people are well, well aware with the, the vans, especially uh, early on the history of the, of the experimental, they bought certified engines, um, but that, that didn't kind of sit with the, the ethos of the home builder. Uh, they wanted something a little different. They wanted the newer technologies. They wanted it, uh, quite honestly, a cheaper price. So um, we launched the non-cert line, primarily starting with vans, but that obviously spread out through the other OEMs as well. And then we noticed that there was a pretty high interest in high performance engines like the Monty Barrett's, the, the Lycon. So we wanted to do our own. We did our own little spin on it. That that being Thunderbolt, we don't quite go as extensive as some of those big high performance guys go, but um, we make it safe. So safe, reliable, with a little bit of extra. So kind of up to that point, most builders were going for either rebuilt or stock Lycoming engines, Yep. if that was what the airplane was designed around. Yep. So that was an opportunity for you guys to say, hey, we have a little something extra. Yep. So I know currently you guys have a slightly different approach in terms of the manufacturing of the certified OE engines and the Thunderbolts. Yep. Give us a top line view. What are the What's the differences between those two engines? Sure, we actually have three product lines, the certified stuff, we have the non-certified stuff, which kind of mimics the certified, goes down the same line. Thunderbolt is built in a separate portion of our factory. It's kind of like a, a hands-on or one-on-one -on -one build with a builder, or the more skilled builders are building them. So they start, they do everything from checking in the parts to painting them, assembly. Uh, we do share the test cell, but then they do all of the packaging for shipping as well. So it's one person, one builder building your engine. Um, you get ported and polished cylinders, so a little better performance. We get weight balance within a half a gram to the rotating assembly, so we're smoother. Uh, and then, of course, we get the visual horsepower of paint colors and chrome parts. So uh, it's show and go. Never underestimate the value of a nice paint job on that. That's a, right, on visual a, horsepower. For sure, exactly. So in terms of the sales, have those done well? I mean, what's, what's, do you have a sense of the proportion of sort of standard engines that go into kids versus Thunderbolts? Absolutely. So um, Van's obviously the gorilla, so I'll speak to that so I can, because uh, I know those numbers generally. Uh, it's actually about 50-50, so about 50% take that uh, more discounted price of the, the non-cert, and about 50% take that, that higher uh, performance, higher, uh, the more premium product, if you will. Um, and generally, it's very model specific. The guys building IRV7s tend to be a little bit more cost conscious, but the guys building the RV14s and the RV10s, if there's a box to make it better, they're checking it. Well, it, truthfully, for that kind of airplane, yeah. your expenditure is already enough that Absolutely. probably the delta on that engine is like, yeah, why not? Yeah, Let's go for the leather. We can afford it, right? And it makes it custom. For, it makes it theirs. So it's, it's very important to them that it, it matches the rest of their paint scheme it, uh, and that when they come to Oshkosh, they can take that cowling off and maybe the, a Lindy is in their future. That's right, exactly right. That's right. So I know Lycoming produces like a phenomenal range of engines on the OE side. Sure. What are the buckets that they fall into for the experimentals? I know it's a, a comparatively limited group. Uh, so on the experimental side, I have that full catalog of parts that I can use to make something that fits into the installation that you're looking for. Obviously, the Vans, uh, the Glass Airs, the all of those airplanes are built around a specific configuration and generally we don't stray away from them so that the builder, may, it's easy for the builder to get them in. Um, but some of the some of those home builders really get, go off, off market and they get cold air induction systems, they get higher compression. So like we go from making 260 horsepower to sometimes like 300. So that's a big performance increase for an RV-10. So as I understand it, if I'm building an airplane and I come to you and say, all right, I'm, I'm thinking about a Thunderbolt. Yep. The spec for my airplane is X, but I'd like to, say, have a front governor, or I'd like to have a different ignition. How does a builder go about ordering that? Yeah, on the on the Thunderbolt side, we do do all of that. We can do customization part by part, looking at what you want. 
Um, if you're building a kit, generally I will sell through the OEM you bought the kit from, just because it, it makes sense uh, from, from both parties. Uh, if you're building something on your own or building a kit that doesn't have an OEM that exists anymore, we also do sell those through our distribution network, and I, I generally work with a, a, a couple of them that are, are familiar with how that ordering process works. So speaking of the distribution network, how, how uh, does a customer actually order a Thunderbolt engine? Uh, so uh, generally you can contact me or, or one of our distributors or an OEM uh, if you want something that's kind of off menu, if you will. Uh, Vans publishes a lot of the, the common stuff, so you can just order straight from their website, but if you wanted something um, different or you're building something different, then you can either contact me directly or you can contact one of our distributors and they will ultimately lead you to me and we'll, we'll outline a configuration. I will help them with the paperwork and place the order. So ultimately, roads lead to you when it roads comes to, lead to me for Thunderbolt. 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 Yep, Lucky yep, guy. Yep, yep. So you know, we know in the industry right now there have been some challenges with supply chain. Uh, Lycoming, like a lot of the, the manufacturers, has had to raise prices over time. Uh, kind of where does where does Thunderbolt fit into that, and, and what's your your look forward? I mean, are we going to be able to shorten the timeline a little bit? What's when? What's the the prognosis on prices going forward? Uh, so 100. percent We'll start with lead time. Lead time. We're trying to bring that down. Uh, we've invested significantly in the, the factory at, back in Williamsport. We've multi-million dollars in new equipment for both cylinders and just general manufacture. Um, so we've actually improved our cylinder manufacture of about 35 or 34% year over year for this year. So we're making improvement. We'll start to see cylinders in stock places. Um, from a cost perspective, uh, it's, it's tough right now. Everybody knows. We've got inflation. We've got... Uh, suppliers that after COVID don't really want to go back into aviation. So, yeah. um, but we are setting up new suppliers. We're bringing some stuff back in house. So we're we're not sitting stagnant. We are working on all the avenues, trying to help bring the cost down, trying to get parts in so that we can can build more and try and keep the price as reasonable as we can. Well, it's no small challenge, and I know so. In terms of those suppliers, I know that there was a a, a time when there were a few parts that were really hard to get. Yep. And and is that kind of predicated on the supplier ability, or is it raw materials? I mean, where does that lead us? Uh, so early COVID, it was primarily raw materials. Uh, we have moved more towards castings being a little bit of an issue, but uh, that's all improving. We've bought new tools and put them at new suppliers, so we've got we've diversified a little bit on the supplier side. Um, it is getting better, generally speaking, um, but we need some time to catch up too. So. It's, it's kind of a big train, isn't it? There's yeah. a lot of pieces involved and, you know, there's a couple thousand parts in, yep. an, in an engine, so you're missing one, you don't build an engine. You can't turn a ship on a dime. Exactly. It takes exactly. a little bit of time. So, and, and in terms of forecasting, I mean, obviously you're, you're making progress there. Uh, if you're building an airplane today, let's say I'm starting an RV-10 or an RV-14, sure. RV how, how far ahead do I need to think in terms of availability? Uh, sure. So an, a standard non-cert engine, I'm generally in 2026. I, at the moment, I'm quoting about uh, two and a half to three years on the Thunderbolt. Just, just being honest with folks mm -hmm. that there might be timelines, clips, and pulls on that side. So uh, anywhere between two and three years, depending on what product you're looking for. Okay. So for builders, that's obviously an important thing to plan for. Uh, we used to, we got, kind of got spoiled, frankly, that we could get engines on fairly short notice sometimes. Uh, that's kind of not the reality in 2024, so as part of your uh, planning, think ahead for that and uh, budgeting a little bit too. So let's switch gears just a little bit. I know you guys have a new configuration of the parallel valve engine you're showing here. We are, yeah. Tweaks and things, walk me through that. Yeah, sure, so we are happy to support the Alaska, Alaska Airmen's Association with their giveaway airplane this year. Uh, Please, very pleased to have it at our booth. It's a beautiful airplane. Um, we're supporting that with a, a little bit of a different design. It's a it's a traditional 360 parallel, what would would have been 185 horsepower, but we put a cold air induction on it off of our 390, and it makes a little more horsepower. It's up to 185, and it weighs a little less. So, and those guys never want more horsepower, right? I, it went the right way in both ways. It's a little lighter and a little more horsepower. So, yeah, made the right moves. So, from a development standpoint, obviously you can throw some hot rod parts at it. Yep. Is Lycoming uh, sort of required to do a lot of durability testing? I mean, it's, it's one thing to kind of put the pieces together, but you're responsible for the whole product. What's that look like? Sure, uh, so on the non-cert side, generally I don't, we're not required to do it. Lycoming will not do anything that our engineering team feels at risk. So in this situation, all of those parts have been certification, through certification on various certified models. So we're comfortable with it being in that configuration uh, on an, a non-cert product. I right. can't certify it at the moment without doing a, pro, a cert program, but 
That's the, the glory of home builders. I can kind right. of do a little different things. Let me take care of it. I'll, let me try it on. Yeah. It's like, oh, your warranty? Well, okay. Anyway. Keep a warranty. Keep, Keep a warranty. warranty. Yeah. I love it. Uh, once again, switching gears. Uh, a quick thing on fuels. Absolutely. A lot of people are concerned about fuels right now. And uh, where does Lycoming stand on that? And is there any more information that our guys Absolutely. can get? Absolutely. Uh, we want an unleaded fuel solution just as bad as everybody else. We, we understand there's multiple paths to it, whether that be PAPI, which is our primary support, PAPI Eagle, um, but we also understand that there's uh, solutions through SDC, and we are, uh, we are not, dis we're not disparaging that for way of looking at it either. Uh, my recommendation is Lycoming has published a uh, sort of FAQ, if you will, on our website at lycoming.com slash fuels. Generally, I think it answers any of the questions that uh, buyers are having at the moment, but if you do have more questions, our engineers are also holding office hours at our booth from three to four to talk about fuels specifically with engineers. So uh, we want to be really proactive this year about fuels. We want it to work. We want the general aviation to work with unleaded future. So yeah. we're here to support it. I think it's fair to say that the, the fuel's future is really important, and it really kind of plays into how you spec your engine, if you're going to be cautious about it, you know, but realistically, we really need a 100 low lead replacement. There are a lot of airplanes that need the 100 octane. So that's kind of where we got to go. I think a dual fuel solution is a particularly great. Chris, thank you very much yep, for your time. No problem. I, thank you, great. sir. Thanks for your time. We're going to be